This evening, our talk is entitled Q Through Its Sculpture. And in it, I'm going to be looking at the history and development of Q. And this talk is a joint venture with my friend Shirley Clark, as mentioned. And the talk came about because Shirley, at the back, volunteers for the charity Art UK. So firstly, how do we define sculpture? Well, traditionally, sculpture is defined as the art of making two or three dimensional representative or abstract forms, especially by carving stone or wood or by casting metal or plaster. Today, the definition is expanded to include construction and assembling, enabling the use of a wider variety of materials. And it is therefore so much more than just a figure on a plinth. And here we'll be looking at these two and three dimensional forms that mirror the development of Q. Our first slide is entitled Keho and sits just to the east of Kew Bridge on the towpath by Kew Pier. It was unveiled in April 2000 and consists of two separate pieces made of Portland stone with a hand-carved inscription on the rounded piece as shown here on our next slide. And this says, Q from the word Keho, 1327, key-shaped spur of land. And this explains why one part of the sculpture is in the shape of a keyhole, with the second part, with the inscription, being the key. So in our story of Q, although the sculpture is modern, it takes us back to medieval times, when Q, or Keho as it was then known, was just a small collection of fishermen's cottages and farmland. Mark Folds, the sculptor of this piece, explains the name Keho was first used by the Anglo-Saxons and meant key, based on the shape of the riverbank at that point. The Thames was, of course, an extremely important source of food and trade for those who lived by its banks in Anglo-Saxon and medieval times and fishing was Kew and Brentford's largest occupation industry. We're next going over to the other side of the river, slightly outside Kew. This again is a modern sculpture, Liquidity, and it stands on the Brentford bank of the, f of the river at Ferry Point, opposite Kew Gardens and marking the entrance to Brentford Dock. Created by Simon Packard in 2002, this six metre tall and nine metre wide stainless steel structure is designed as three waves engraved with hand cut curved lines and fish. The lines are cut right through the metal so that light shines through them. In medieval times, as we've said, fishing was the largest industry in the area and disputes frequently arose between the fishermen and the boatmen. In the 21st century, fish continued to be a cause of upset, as a number of residents objected violently to the size of this sculpture when it was erected, as it reduced their views of the river. However, 20 years on, the sculpture still stands and the fish still weave across the metal waves. And though it stands on the Brentford bank of the river, liquidity encapsulates the medieval story of this part of the Thames and therefore of Kew as well. But now we move back across the river to Kew, where very close to the river bank and Kew Pier is the area known as Westerly Ware. And this is a sli slide of Westerly Ware gates, and I hope you can make out the name Westerly Ware. It's, it's, it was a hard one to photograph this. These gates are the entrance to land used by fishermen in the Middle Ages to pull up and dry their nets and sort their catch. 
The name comes from the netting weirs that were set up across the river to trap fish. The word weir transforming to the word where over time. This area is crown land and the sculpture we're looking at here with the gates with westerly ware written across the top. Well, these were commissioned in 2007 by the Westerly Ware Association and were made by Shelley Thomas from the Brentford Forge at Kew Steam Museum from galvanised mild steel. And we'll return to look at the other gates at Westerly Ware as a later part of our story. Now, back to the map here, you might be forgiven at this point for wondering if we're going to see any sculptures that are somewhat older. This is, after all, a talk for the local history society. Fear not. Our next sculptures date from the 1700s. And these are two milestones, both made of Portland stone, one in Richmond, the one on the left, which stands opposite the Orange Tree Public House and whose lettering was recut in 1989 by the Richmond Society, and the other very weathered one on Kew Road, just by the wall of Kew Gardens opposite the end of Holmesdale Road. The Richmond milestone clearly reads eight miles from Hyde Park Corner, and apparently the Kew one says seven miles from Hyde Park Corner, but this is now impossible to make out. They are both grade two listed and are thought to have been erected in the latter part of the 18th century, perhaps when the first Q bridge was put in place. But why, however, are they important for our story of Q? This is an extract from Patterson's Road Book, a timetable for coach travel in the 18th century. By the late 1700s, travel by coach was becoming more frequent and milestones marked the way. Patterson's Road Book, which ran to 18 editions from 1771 to 1829, was designed to guide the traveller along the major roads of England and Wales, helping them not only to get from A to B, but to appreciate the landmarks along the way. The main west road out of London was the Bath Road, which went through Brentford. Our two milestones were placed on the road that diverted from this, across the, second, the Kew Bridge heading south to Kew and Richmond, the home of royalty. The 1822 version of Patterson's Road Book tells us that at Brentford, a little way beyond the six mile stone, Kew Bridge on the other side of which is Kew Palace and close to it, a chateau erected by his late majesty, who was of course, George III. The first Kew Bridge was erected between 1758 and 1759, replacing a ferry which had plied its trade for many, many years. This stone and wooden arched bridge lasted only 30 years when it was replaced by one built entirely of stone. But by the late 1890s, it was clear that with the increase in traffic, this bridge was no longer adequate, both in terms of the weight it could bear and the problems caused by the narrow and steep approach to the bridge on the Brentford side. A third bridge was needed, and this was commissioned jointly by the Middlesex and Surrey County Councils, and it bears the arms of both counties in cartouches on either side of the bridge. You can see that. This was opened on the 20th of May, 1903 by King Edward VII. The grade two listed bridge is made of masonry clad with Scottish granite and it's thought that the cartouches are carved from granite as well. 
And for the purposes of this talk, it's the cartouche containing the Surrey arms, which is the most interesting. The Surrey cartouche consists of an elaborate floral surround surmounted by what seems to be an image of Father Thames. And enclosed at the top, the arms of the earldom of Surrey, called the, known as the Surrey Checks. At the bottom right are the arms of Guildford, with its Norman castle. Slightly hard to make out, but they're there. And bottom left are the arms of Kingston, showing three salmon. These salmon, which indicate the presence of fisheries in the river, suggest that in 1572, when these arms of Kingston were first recorded, fishing and the trade associated with it was the major source of income for the town. The parish of Kingston, being rather larger than it is today, included Kew until 1769. And the symbol symbolism on the cartouche of Father Thames and the fisheries clearly connect us back to the medieval and Tudor history of Kew. The river in Kew was important to the ordinary person for work and trade. And for the wealthy, the wealthy it was a means of traveling to Kew to enjoy their land and estates. Richmond was a favorite place for, for royalty from as early as the 14th century. Where royalty was, so the aristocracy wanted to be. And by Tudor times, there were many substantial lordly dwellings in Kew. Even royalty in the four figures of Mary Tudor and Anne Boleyn lived here in Kew for a short period of time in the 16th century. Queen Caroline, the wife of George II, acquired the lease of the Dutch house, now Kew Palace, between 1728 and 1729, thus setting the royal seal of approval on Kew. In 1759, Princess Augusta founded a nine-acre botanic garden within the royal lands at Kew. In 1802, George III united the royal estates of Richmond and Kew. And in 1840, responsibility for these estates was transferred from the royal family to the government. Throughout its history, the land occupied by Kew Gardens has been restricted to the public in some, some way. And it's significant to note that even today that remains. Access into Kew Gardens is through a gate only after a fee has been paid. But after 1840, the public were agitating for greater access to the gardens, necessitating the opening of more gates. Our talk now looks at the public entrances to the gardens, those along Kew Road and onto Kew Green, many of which remind us of the Royal Connection. Firstly, let's look at the Lion and Unicorn gates both now grade two listed. The lion and the unicorn symbolize royal power. And the fact that these animal figures remain today on the walls of Kew Gardens is a constant reminder that this was royal land. And whilst royalty only lived in Kew for a hundred years or so, their influence on the landscape and development of the area has remained. The Lion Gate is still in use today as the southernmost entrance to the gardens, whilst the Unicorn Gate, for many years used as a staff entrance, is not. The Lion Gate is built from London stock brick, capped with a Portland stone entablature, whilst the Unicorn Gate is built just from Portland stone. But what magnificent figures are on top of these two gates? 
The statues of the lion and the unicorn date from the early 1800s, when Kew Palace and its grounds were still royal property. But the gates we see today all date from after 1840. However, the lion and the unicorn didn't start life where they are today. Instead, these supporters of the royal coat of arms were commissioned by George IV to adorn the top of two small lodges which were designed by Thomas Hardwick, as you can see here. These, as can be seen from the picture, stood either side of the gates which were required when the king extended the royal property in 1825 and enclosed the western end of Kew Green. Just six years later, in 1831, this enclosure was revoked and the lodges and the railings were removed thus making the figures of the lion and the unicorn temporarily redundant. The two animals are made of stone, but not of stone that is carved. No, these were made of code stone, a type of extremely durable artificial stone material created at kilns in Lambeth, which were owned by Eleanor Code and which were on the site of what is now the Royal Festival Hall. Code stone was a composite stone and apparently a tenth of, a, of the price of what a carved figure would cost. The Code Artificial Stone Manufactory received the royal warrant from George III and the Prince Regent. But Code stone was not restricted to royal buildings. It became the most widely used material for statues of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Our lion, having left Kew Green, was perhaps in storage for a few years, but by 1840 was sighted in its present position. Records for what happened to the unicorn after its removal from Kew Green do not exist but it must have travelled away from Kew, for the statue was bought back from a builder in Richmond in 1849 for £7. <laughs> At that point, it was moved to its current site. Now, the gates. The most magnificent of the gates of Kew Gardens are those on Kew Green, the Elizabeth Gates. These were renamed in 2012 to mark the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. They had previously just been known as the main gates. These wrought iron, grade two star listed gates were designed by Des Decimus Burton, who is perhaps most famous for having designed the triple screen at Hyde Park Corner. The ironwork was molded by Walker of Rotherham, a firm founded in 1746 and which had, over the intervening years, become one of the largest companies in the north of England. They made a variety of iron and steel products ranging from household implements to cannon and indeed had made 80 of the 105 cannon on board HMS Victory, Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar. The wonderful Portland stone piers seen here with floral and fruit motifs and four ram's heads separated by a floral swag either side of the gates were carved by John Henning the Younger, an artist often employed by Decimus Burton. The pair of globular vases on the outer stone pillars, however, are said to have come to queue in the time of William IV. The central carriage gates are supported by two large Portland stone pillars and are flanked by two smaller, less ornate stone pillars, each supporting a single pedestrian gate. Interestingly, although the gardens had by now become the government's responsibility, the gates incorporate the royal coat of arms with the letters VR. 
proof of the determination of the then director of Kew Gardens, Sir William Hooker, who commissioned the gates to maintain Kew's royal links. In 1892, however, the gates did attract a little controversy. A correspondent to the Richmond and Twickenham Times wrote about the latest attraction in connection with Kew Gardens, namely the colour of the principal gates facing Kew Green. The gates, it transpires, had been painted a flashy red colour for which there is no raison d'etre in truth or taste. He goes on. These gates of Kew Gardens are not perhaps of the finest possible workmanship, yet not at all to be despised. The gates, now black, are grade two star listed and considered one of Decimus Burton's finest achievements. Another gate you might be familiar, familiar with is that near the Temperate House. Though in fact, these have only been in place since the recent renovation of the glass house. These unlisted gates were also designed by Decimus Burton, though on this occasion, the gates were made by Richard Turner. He was an Irish iron founder and manufacturer of glass houses. And he also worked with Decimus Burton on the Palm House at Kew. These gates were first known as the Queen Elizabeth Gates and were originally intended to provide a riverside entrance to Kew Palace. Their name came from this location, which was originally known as Queen Elizabeth's Lawn. By tradition, the place where Queen Elizabeth I and Robert Dudley arranged to meet. These gates are less ornate than those located on Kew Green and consist of a central pair of cast iron rails within a frame with wrought iron embellishments surmounted by an ornate decorative wrought iron arch which contains the letters VR with a crown above. The piers at the side are made of brick and capped by decorative wrought iron finials. As I mentioned, these particular gates, though dating back to 1846, have only recently been put in place. So what gates were here when the grand entrance opposite the Temperate House was created in 1868? Sir Joseph Hooker, then director of Kew Gardens, had planned a grand carriage entrance for visitors and royalty, thinking that many would arrive at the, the Kew station, which was to be built opposite the Temperate House. This was not to be, however, as the station was in the end located further north. And so this entrance to Kew Gardens never opened to the public. But by the time this was decided, a new lodge had been built beside the entrance and the Selwyn estate who owned the land opposite had designed red brick houses to match this and gates had been put in place. In 1868, elaborate wrought iron gates with an elaborate scroll design and an ornamental cast iron arch, arched lintel above were erected at the temperate house entrance. These gates, made by the Colebrookdale Ironworks in Shropshire from a stock design number 77 in their catalogue and probably designed by Joseph Kershaw, principal designer at the foundry in 1860, stood between Portland stone piers bearing the crown and VR in roundels surmounted by stone urns. These with the addition of the Royal Arms, cost 75 pounds. Two hand gates with locks and hangings for the stone pillars cost an extra 25 pounds each. 
As previously mentioned, however, these gates were never opened to the public. In, and in 1889, these grade two listed gates were moved to their current position opposite the end of Litchfield Road. This entrance became known as Victoria Gate and here they still stand and they're of course open to the public. However, the locals were up in arms about this move and one resident wrote to the Echo in 1882. Officialism at Kew Gardens. Sir, allow me to call the attention of the Commissioner of Works and the public through your paper to what is now taking place at Kew Gardens. Some years ago, very handsome iron gates were erected in the Richmond Road opposite the Temperate House and by far, in my opinion, the prettiest entrance to the gardens. Miss Marianne North's picture gallery was erected by the side of the entrance and added very much to the charm of the spot. The trustees of the Selwyn estate so arranged the roads as to bring a wide road opposite the gate and for the site of a new church a short distance up this said road that it might also add to the beauty of this entrance and to the temperate house. Would you believe it, sir, on passing that way on Saturday last, I found these gates and piers were partly demolished. And I was informed that it was the intention of Sir Joseph Hooker to remove the gates and refix a portion of them in one of the most ugly parts of the Richmond Road without a house anywhere near it, and certainly the least interesting part of the gardens, where it is neither convenient as an entrance gate for visitors, nor, I should think, as a cart road. I was also informed Sir Joseph intends to block this opening with one of those ugly brick walls he appears to have on the brain. I hope some steps will at once be taken to stop this work. Sir Joseph Hooker seems to have a weakness for destroying everything that adds to the beauty of these gardens and to annoy as much as possible the residents in this district. I am, sir, yours faithfully, resident. <laughs> this had no effect on Sir Joseph Hooker, however, and the gates remained in their new position at what is now the Victoria Gate. Before the decision was made to move these gates to become Victoria Gate, local estate owner and builder George Engelhart took the opportunity to enhance the prestige of his land, slightly to the north of the present Victoria Gate, by offering to finance a new gate. And so in 1869, a set of carriage gates, identical in design, number 77, to those still in situ at that point near the temperate house were ordered at a cost of 75 pounds and installed opposite the end of what later became Kew Gardens Road. The entrance was named Cumberland Gate after earlier residents of Kew, the Dukes of Cumberland, and these gates are now grade two listed. We now move to a different aspect of the development of Kew, and that is memorials to the dead. Only a minority of people in Georgian times were able to afford the luxury of a permanent memorial, but the Georgians relished their monuments and considerable numbers survive today. The designers and sculptors of these memorials have long since been forgotten, but their skill and craftsmanship survives. We're fortunate that St Anne's Churchyard on Kew Green contains examples of many different types of, types of memorial, from simple headstones to elaborate casket tombs. We're only going to look here at one such tomb from the 18th century, and that is the tomb of William Ayton. Although Ayton started out as a humble Scottish gardener, he became extremely successful and was persuaded 
to take charge of the Botanic Gardens at Kew in 1759 under Lord Bute, beginning his illustrious career as gardener to his majesty at Kew. This elevation in position enabled his family to have this tomb constructed after his death in February 1793. It consists of a pared back casket tomb set on a plinth, which is now sunken into the ground, lacking the usual elaborate lion's feet supports. The side panels slope upwards and outwards, and the roof is gently domed, surmounted with a plain carved classical urn. Three of the panels are inscribed with the names and dates of the Aiton family. William, his wife Elizabeth, their four daughters, and two sons who are buried here. The inscriptions were recut in 1993, but are sadly now barely visible. Unlike some of its neighboring tombs, it contains no effusive language or decoration. With its straight lines and neoclassical style, the tomb exudes simplicity and elegance. In 1793, the Marchioness of Rockingham wrote of William Ayton that she was quite charmed with the plainness of his manners, without a grain of that pomposity one might have expected. Qualities which are clearly reflected in the design of his tomb. From the late 19th and early 20th century, traditional churchyards had become overfilled with burials. Purpose-built cemeteries were now the order of the day. The acquisition of land in the borough of Richmond by Fulham Council in 1904 and by Hammersmith Council in the 1920s for use as overspill cemeteries dramatically altered the landscape on the eastern side of Kew, changing what was farmland into memorials for the dead. The two cemeteries built 20 years apart, both had functionality, but also beauty and care in their execution. In some ways they were the same, but they also interestingly reflect the styles of their respective times. And this we see in their sculptural elements. A quote from the Fulham Chronicle of the 26th of October 1906 comments that in the new cemetery, a handsome stone wall with artistic railings fronts the road, and the semicircular entrance gives a stately finish to it. London Cemeteries, an illustrated guise and gazetteer by Hugh Meller and Brian Parsons, first published in 1981, mentions the bulbous stone piers along the perimeter wall. By 1926, however, when Hammersmith opened its cemetery on the other side of the Mortlake Road, the one that's now known as Mortlake Cemetery, fashions had changed. This cemetery was created while Robert Hampton Klukas was borough engineer and surveyor of Hammersmith. And apparently the project cost 31,000 pounds, more than two million pounds in today's money. The influence of the Art Deco architectural style is clearly apparent in the red brick pillars, which hold the gates and surround the whole site. The straight lines and geometric shapes are very different from the bulbous style of the North Sheen Cemetery across the road. The book London Cemeteries describes this cemetery as being designed on a grandiose scale and that it has two sets of fanciful gate piers with acorn finials. Acorns are believed to represent many things, but here their connection with rebirth and the cycle of life and the seasons may well have been the symbolism the designers of the century were looking for. Sorry, the cemetery were looking for. Memorials 
were also important in marking the passing of many soldiers and civilians who died during the Great War of 1914 to 18, and also during the Second World War, which started just 21 years after the end of the first one. Walk round most cemeteries today and you'll come across memorials to the war dead, both military and civilian. All too frequently, the designers and builders of these memorials are lost in history, but the sculpture remains and is a poignant and long-lasting reminder of loss. In the cemeteries we've looked at, there are two memorials to civilians who lost their lives during World War II. In North Sheen Cemetery, a Portland stone plaque is set in a York stone wall. Whilst in Mortlake Cemetery, a Grade II listed memorial in Portland Stone and Westmoreland Slate is, as Historic England puts it, an elegant and characteristically restrained example of a post-war public cemetery memorial. In 1918, Sir Reginald Blomfield designed for the Imperial War Graves Commission what was to become a defining site in cemeteries throughout Britain and the Commonwealth, the Cross of Sacrifice. This was an elongated Latin cross fashioned from stone and mounted with a downward facing bronze longsword. There is one such memorial in each of the cemeteries we've looked at. The memorial in the North Sheen Cemetery commemorates those who fell in both world wars, while that in Mortlake Cemetery commemorates those who fell in World War II. The inscription on the one in North Sheen reads, This cross of sacrifice is one in design and intention with those which have been set up in France and Belgium and other places throughout the world, where our dead of the Great War are laid to rest. Whilst that on the Mortlake cross reads, Their glory shall not be blotted out. And there is a third similar memorial, this one cited on Kew Green. And on the 25th of June, 1921, the Kew Green War Memorial was unveiled by Field Marshal Sir William R. Robertson. This grade two listed cross of sacrifice is made of Portland stone set on a plinth, which is in turn set upon two stepped octagonal bases. Unusually, the cross is not mounted with the bronze longsword. Originally, names of servicemen lost were engraved on the memorial. In 1947, the cross was in a poor state with the name so defaced that a bronze plaque was attached to the plinth, inscribed with the words, their name liveth forevermore. The names of the men of this parish who died for their country in the two wars, 1914-1918 and 1939-1945, are inscribed in the adjacent church of St. Anne. This is the memorial of their honour and of the gratitude of the people of Kew. Another sculptural piece commemorating the war dead of Kew takes us back to Westerly Ware. Westerly Ware was first enclosed in 1922 using the monies collected in the local War Memorial Fund. And it was decided that six tennis courts would be constructed and the rest laid out for children's games and for seating. It is the entrance that concerns us here though. With its sculpted pillars and metal gates and in particular, the part connecting the two gateposts. In 1926, Hill and Smith Limited of Briarley Hill, Staffordshire, were asked to submit designs for a scroll to fix over the gates at a cost not exceeding 25 pounds. This was to be manufactured in wrought iron with cast iron enrichments. And here we see this scroll with the words Q War Memorial. Today, a sculpture as a memorial is used not only for an individual or groups of individuals, but also to enhance an environment, to create a sanctuary where people can remember and re reflect upon those who've died. 
And this can be seen in queue in the Gardens of Remembrance at Mortlake Crematorium. Here, sculpture creates a tranquil and soothing atmosphere. In the Babies and Children's Garden of Remembrance, we can find a floral fountain made from copper and hand-blown glass in orange and yellow. The garden tries, through imagery, to explain death to young children by referencing the story Waterbugs and Dragonflies by Doris Strictly. The artist and sculptor of the fountain, Meher Tafrishi, has created gent gently waving dragonflies which hover above the pond beneath. In the floral garden, another copper sculpture by the same artist, Mehad Tafrishi, cascades over water. This symbolizes a tree of tranquility, formed of a framework of trunk, branches, and twigs, and water trickles through the individually sculpted leaves. But perhaps the me next major change to the infrastructure of Kew was the arrival in 1976 of the Public Records Office, renamed the National Archives in 2003, just to the east of the railway bridge. Here again, sculpture helps tell this story, though not until 1995, when metalwork gates were placed at the entrance leading from Ruskin Avenue. And it is these gates designed by Alan Evans, a leading blacksmith artist, that I'll look at next. Now, though it's not perhaps immediately apparent, the design of these gates is hugely symbolic for the historical importance of the archives. For the notched posts seen here, refer back to the medieval tally sticks which form part of the holdings of the National Archives. Here we go. The notches on a stick indicated the amount of tax payable, ranging in size from a palm's width through to the width of a thumb, a little finger, a grain of wheat, or even as thin as an incised line. The notches were carved on both sides of the stick, which was then split in half so that both pieces carried the same record. At the end of the year, these were then compared to see that the record had not been changed. The tally sticks were used to record tax revenue levels agreed between the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the County Sheriffs. Exchequer officials continued to use tallies and until 1826, with very large tally sticks created to record huge sums of money. And it was the burning of these unwanted tally sticks in 1834 that caused the fire that destroyed the old Houses of Parliament. The National Archives, Archives is, of course, a nationally important institution. And this is reflected in two modern sculptures created for Levitt Square, recently built on what was the site of the Inland Revenue Sorting Office adjacent to the archives. The two sculptures named The Archive and The Quills were commissioned by Taylor Wimpey in 2017. They were made by David Harbour using oxidized mild steel and stainless steel. The archive consists of five curved panels with lasered cutouts, which are placed to resemble a formal letter, while the mir mirror polished tab at the top of each panel suggests a filing cabinet. The quills is made up of six curved sheets of oxidized stainless steel. They seem to be cut and fragmented, representing tattered paper. While at the same time, the top of each sheet is shaped to look like an upside down, old fashioned pen nib. In this way, the sculptures reference both the archives and the sorting office. 
this brings me to the last section of our talk. In the 21st century, with many public locations around the country already boasting a piece of sculpture, architects and local authorities focus their attention on bringing sculpture to housing developments, aiming to include sculpture to bring human interest and aesthetic pleasure to their inhabitants. If you have walked through Kew Riverside, maybe you will have noticed this mirror-polished stainless steel monolith rising from the ground with water flowing down the sides. The surface tension here creates rhythmical wave patterns, and the piece is entitled Miss Prism, reflecting its shape. It was designed by William Pye, who works mostly in stainless steel and cast bronze, and for whom water has been an integral part of his work since the 1980s. Further along the road is Q Eccentric Empress, designed and created by Danny Lane, an American who's worked in London since the 1980s. He's known and noted for his work with glass. And in Q Eccentric Empress, we have 12 millimeter thick float glass discs. <laughs> Hope I've got that right. <laughs> Threaded onto a stainless steel rod held together by tension. His inspiration for the piece was his fascination with the Solomonic or corkscrew-like column. The last sculpture, located in the St. James's development, is White Light Passage, a work in stainless steel tubing by John Gibbons. This came out of a number of works he produced entitled Body and Soul, and White Light Passage reflects his thought, thoughts on the soul leaving the body. None of these three sculptures is old. They were created in the last 30 years. So what do they have to do with our local history? Well, they're firmly positioned, they're here to stay, and so they are now part of our history and development of Kew. Everyone will be inspired by and experience sculpture in different ways. Perhaps our last two sculptures will further broaden the way in which sculpture and its use can be perceived. Now, mosaics have a long history, beginning in Mesopotamia in the third century BC, much used in ancient Greece and Rome. Their popularity is also seen in our locality. We have found three mosaic sculptures in Kew and one in Ischine. We'll talk about just one of these this evening and leave you to search out the others. <laughs> there Be Monsters is situated in front of the National Archives building. This mosaic globe dates from 2005 and was funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and the National Archives. It is decorated with ceramic monsters inspired by the National Archives map collection. Here there be monsters was a phrase written against uncharted waters on the first maps. Ancient cartographers didn't know what was out there, so the assumption was that it had to be terrible. The value of this sculpture comes perhaps not only from its appearance and historical references, but also from the fact that it was made by users of Workshop and Company, part of the Central and Northwest London Mental Health Trust. Those involved were people suffering with mental health issues, and as a spokeswoman from the Heritage Lottery Fund commented, the globe structure is a triumph, and we hope that There Be Monsters will inspire further access improvements for mental health and other hard to reach groups to be involved in their archives across the UK. We were pleased to award a grant of £14,000. The final sculpture in our overview of Q and how a study of these sculptures can help us to trace Q's history is the sundial at the entrance to the St. James's development. 
it appears to be made of stone and tells not the time of day, but the month of the year. We have not been able to find out any more about this particular piece of work. But how appropriate in this talk, reflecting the development of Q through its sculptural heritage, that we end with a sculpture commemorating time and its passing. In conclusion, we can see how sculpture in Q reflects the changes that have occurred over time. We have seen sculpture as a helpful aid, for example, the milestones, as a sign of ownership, as seen in the gates of Kew Gardens and Kew Bridge, as a commemoration, both military and civilian, as a historical reference, as in Levitt Square, the National Archives gates and the Westerly Ware gates. And as we reach more modern times, we can see the use of sculpture in the new housing developments alongside the river as an addition to the landscape that enhances the environment and provides enjoyment to residents and visitors alike. Q has a long and varied history. The sculptural legacy of Q informs and reminds us of this. Thank you. <laughs> I need some now. <laughs> Thank you, Shirley. That was a fascinating presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it was actually actually two speakers tonight, but one hasn't spoken yet. <laughs> and would Shirley Clark like, like, like to join us? Where is Shirley? Yes, the back. The back. She's bringing the reference file with her. <laughs> Just in case anyone's got any difficult Shirley questions. Shirley Clark put the presentation together and left Shirley Newton to deliver it. Well no, done, No, I Shirley. put it well. We put it together. <laughs> and um, are you ha you're happy to join the question and answer session? Do we have any questions, please? Probably not. Uh, Judy has a comment. A comment from Caroline Blomfield, who says, Sir Reginald Blomfield, architect designer of the Cross of Sacrifice, was a cousin of the late David Blomfield of Richmond Local History Society. Thanks for that. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? No. Yes. Can you wait, wait for, the, for the microphone, Simon? Ray? Thank you. Just an observation on, on why Q might have been important to the royalty. It's to do with the tidal patterns on the Thames. The tide on the Thames here takes about four hours just to come in and eight hours to go out. If you were leaving the Palace of uh, Westminster heading for Hampton Court, about as far as you can get on an incoming tide is Q. There's no point rowing past that because <coughs> the tide is going to wash you back out. So you have to moor up, park your boat and uh, spend the night. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Very interesting. More points. Simon. Simon Target. Yeah. I thought that was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Great detail. And I love the story about um, um, Elizabeth I and Robert Dudley meeting. I, di I didn't know about that. Um, <laughs> so I, you talked about a person called Eleanor Code, I think. Um, I, I was struck by the fact that you had, there was such a um, entrepreneurial woman in the 18 mm. whatever 20s or something inventing presumably a type of stone or I don't know but uh, I wondered if you had any more information about she, her. She um, had a factory for something else I think to start with and then she met someone who had um, developed the recipe for this um, artificial stone and she um, I think went into business with him but then rapidly got rid of him and uh, <laughs> if I remember the story correctly. And, um, and she was very, very successful. And if your code stone is, is an amazing subject and um, a, a local example outside Ham House, the figure of Father Thames, um, just outside Ham, Ham House, um, you, you go in the gates and then there's a little round bit and Father, Father Thames is in the middle, that is made of code stone. And the other really famous example of code stone is perhaps the lion on Westminster Bridge, 
which looks as perfect today as the day it was made 200 years ago. Um, but code stone was used enormously in embellishments on um, houses around 1800 or so. Um, uh, lots of, um, because it could be molded. So um, it was a fantastic um, use to embellish houses. Uh, so really and interesting. It's a lot less expensive as well than yeah. ordinary than having to carve yeah. a stone. Yeah. Just to say that the, um, the river god, which is in the crescent in front of Ham House, is a replica of it in Terrace Gardens, above the river in Richmond. It's a re the one in Ham House is a replica? No, the one in Terrace Gardens. Oh, the Terrace Gardens is a replica of... of oh, is it? Oh, right. Thank you. A lot of the kind of recent um, controversy about um, sculptures, or perhaps more... Um, accurately um, statues has been about you know representation of people who are now controversial whereas all these examples are either abstract or mythical people things are there any local examples of you know statues which might be controversial or well-known people in Richmond there are a whether they'll be controversial or not i don't know but there's the um, uh, um i believe there's uh, there's the chilean the chilean founder is it bernardo, bernardo, bernardo O'Higgins. 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 there are very few actual statues of people as far as i can tell yeah. um ellis Wick whitaker who was the founder of whitaker ellis, was, whitaker the, ellis. was the mayor of richmond yeah he, there's a bust of him in the um in the, uh, in in the, the old town, town hall. hall. Yes. But we don't have a lot in the borough. And there's going to be one of Virginia Woolf, I think. Well, maybe, maybe, yes, which has a, a, mm. quite a lot of controversy over whether there should be one of Virginia Woolf or not. But she wasn't, wasn't a slave owner, as, as no. far as we know. No. <laughs> Though she did say, rather dead than live in Richmond. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Shirley and Shirley, for a super talk and the um, preparation of that talk. Um, I've always been struck by the sculptural qualities of the boundaries, boundary walls of the two cemeteries, North Sheen and um, uh, Mortlake cemeteries. Um, do we know who actually designed um, those um, piers, gate piers? We've lost, sadly, I think as part of the war effort, I suspect, the, all the original arts and crafts ironwork around the first cemetery, mm. and presumably the later slightly art deco ironwork around the second cemetery. But the, thank goodness that the stone and the brickwork survives on, on both. But they, they do have a really distinct arts and crafts quality to them. And it, with the greatest respect to the borough engineers or borough surveyors of each respective borough at the time, one can only sort of surmise that they were the work of somebody else rather than the mm. um, well, yeah. uh, borough officers. You, you say that. I mean, there, the, uh, a lot of the notable cemeteries in London or in the area or in the country are do have architectural um, stone by um, recognised sculptors. We don't have that. We are both uh, the cemeteries were designed and built by the borough engineers and surveyors of Hammersmith and Fulham, respectively. But they are interesting characters, and I think a lot of the uh, normal cemeteries are made by them, by the borough surveyors. And so they do have, um, they, do, they do come up with these wonderful ideas and, and um, put them into practice, even though they are just surveyors and uh, engineers. But the... Um, North Sheen Cemetery was designed by a, a gentleman called Francis Wood and he was um, the surveyor, in 1901 he was appointed the surveyor for Fulham, uh, chief engineer and borough surveyor and um, he did a lot of sort of interesting, he, he experimented with things like asphalt uh, for, for coverings for the, for the roads and he was also one of the first borough engineers to um, to devise a system for basically recycling metal during the, world, the First World War. He created this system in the local municipal tip to, to take metal out and so they could recycle it. Uh, so they do have very interesting 
um, backgrounds. Um, for the Mortlake Cemetery, it was designed by a gentleman called Robert Clucas Ham Hampton Clucas, and um, again, he was um, he was involved with many of the different um, uh, sanitary um, aspects of uh, of Hammersmith, the swimming pools he helped make, and various other items. So they do they, they do they, they're sort of underplayed a bit. I think they do have quite a big um, role to play in in the local in, in their local borough. Three public mosaics in the borough. We said there were three in Richmond, in, in Kew. In Kew. And one in Isheen. Okay, is one of them to do with the World Wide Web? Yes. yes. That's in Sheen. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well done, you get the prize. <laughs> Who can find the other? I've got a question from the back. Well, 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 let uh, John go first. Sorry. Yeah. John. Um, <laughs> wish I had one of these. Um, you didn't mention the, I know I just had a, a brainwave, um, the Maids of Honour Row tea rooms. Was that connected with uh, royalty in some way? Um, well, we I don't know how long have they been down there, but... Uh, um, well, they started off in Richmond and then moved to Kew, but we were really we weren't looking at we were just looking at sculpture sculpture so they didn't come into our remit but interesting though they are so interesting prices as well that's yeah. a different talk john <laughs> a different no, talk no, no, <laughs> uh, judy has a question from zoom i think there's a question i'll first say i've got lots of plaudits as well people saying thank you very very much um but uh stephen denny uh, said uh, you showed what looked like a green man on the main gates, but didn't comment on it. Was it a green man? No. On the main gates of what? The Kew Gardens. The Kew Gardens. No. 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 There is a there is an image of a like like a the sun face or a man. Um, it's not known what it is or who it is or what it represents. I'm afraid. Any more questions? One here. Yes, Stephen. is perhaps one step down from the more elevated sculpture that you've been talking about this evening but Q does have one or two rather charming little uh, additions to domestic housing that almost make an entry um, for those who know Annadale Road there's a house which is now part of Abbeyfield that has uh, what looks like the head of a king and the head of a queen and rather charmingly, it also has a little squirrel uh, <laughs> all carved. Uh, I don't know whether they're bought from a, a catalogue in Victorian times or whether they are indeed individual things, but they're, they're one of the little things that pop out. And indeed, on, on Forest Road, for example, there is one of the houses that has a cartouche on the front of it with an anchor. Oh. Um, and one might wonder why does that particular house have that and no, none of the other houses round about do. Well the answer is in fact that the first occupant, I don't know if he was the owner, but the first occupant of that house, uh, a man called Samuel Alfred Hart, was in fact a ship broker and he obviously paid to advertise his trade on the side of his house. I know it's not quite a sculpture but it's a, one of the little sort of highlights of walking round that one might come across. Mm. <laughs> Stephen, will, will you be capturing this in future articles for the, for the journal? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions or comments? <laughs> um, if that's all the questions, I'm going to say a very big thanks to both speakers. I, I feel I've been on a very long walk, but it hasn't uh, been hasn't haven't actually had to leave to, to to leave the room. But actually, it's been a sort of walk, but not a real walk because a real walk comes later, doesn't it? Do you want to say something about about the walk you're organising? Yes. So Wednesday, the fourth of May, at seven o'clock. If you're interested on in coming on a walk, 
through Q to see a good number of these that we've mentioned tonight. We'll be, you'll be very welcome. We'll start and finish at the station. Uh, at, uh, it starts at 7 o'clock, Wednesday the 4th of May. And there's no charge, is that right? You know, no, no booking for it or anything? You just, just, just um, turn up, am I right? Paul is our expert on this. What, Paul, do we charge? Do we, we don't charge, do we? And there are details in the uh, recently issued newsletter, which should have arrived this, this uh, weekend. Yeah. And there's also another event which you're organising, isn't there? Poppy Factory. Poppy Factory. Do you want to say something? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, we've organised a uh, visit to the Poppy Factory on Friday, the 13th of May at 3 pm. And if you'd like to, to join us for that, then either see me at the back or email um, 